Um, so the starting point is we would like we're getting samples of some distribution, and we want to understand. We know nothing about this distribution, nothing at all, and we want to understand what are the properties of this distribution that we can kind of determine very quickly with very few samples. So let's just so that we have an example in our head. A, and it's you smiling. Some half of you have already seen all these slides already, so sorry about that. But the <laughs> but the other half, I hope, will they get something out of it. Suppose you're playing the lottery, okay? So there's lots of lotteries out there. And what are some questions you'd want to know about the lottery before you decide to play it? So first of all, you might want to know, is it actually, it's supposed to be the uniform distribution, but is it really the uniform distribution? Um, secondly, you may want to know, are, you know, are the draws from the lottery actually independent? How can you determine such a thing? Okay, and maybe the lottery's unfair, and Christoph, uh, did he already, oh, there he is. It, he gave me this example. Oh. Oh, so one reason, this is not before Krzysztof, uh, here's a, one example, you could go on the web, uh, there's all kinds of websites selling you past results of the lottery on the idea that this would help you choose your next um, number to buy um, and to have a higher chance of winning. So obviously some websites out there seem to think that the results are not independent. Okay, uh, so we can laugh about that, but here's an example where it's actually true. And this is thanks to Krzysztof. Uh, there's a Polish lottery called Multilatek, and it's a, this thing, it's like a wire basket, a round wire basket, and it's got 80 balls in it. Okay, and every day they take 20 of the balls at random. And this is how the lottery goes. Okay, now the initial machine was actually biased, and the probability of the balls labeled 50 through 59 was too small. And people figured this out before the lottery organizers. And you can see that if you bet here, it's not a good idea, but if you bet here, you have a slight advantage um, in making a lot of money on the lottery. Okay, so this is a great thing. Uh, thank you to Krzysztof for the pointer and Eric Price uh, for the graph. Okay, so. Here's another lottery, the New Jersey, okay, so that, what, what's nice about this lottery is you could actually figure this out pretty quickly because there were only 80 balls, okay? When there's only 80 balls, you have a really good idea of what the probabilities are of each ball very quickly because you're taking 20 balls every day, you know? So after about four days, every ball, every specific ball you expect to see after about four days, right? And after four log 80 days, you expect to see, with coupon collectors, you expect to see them all. Many times you have a pretty good estimate of each of the probabilities of each ball. Okay, so this is a case where you're trying to figure out something about a lottery where the domain size is relatively small. Okay, let's take another example. What about the New Jersey pick three? They have two lotteries. One's called pick three, one's called pick four. What do you do? You pick three digits. Okay, zero to nine, zero to nine, zero to nine. So you have a thousand options. Pick four, 10,000 options. Okay, now, the lottery is drawn, you know, they pick a number between 0 and 1,000, uh, 999, uh, uniformly at random, supposedly. Now you're trying to figure out, is the New Jersey lottery fair? Okay, we did this experiment, um, we haven't redone the experiment, but when we did the experiment in 2000, um, there were 8,522 results for the pick three lottery. You know, the possible, the number of possibilities is 1,000. So, you know, on average you see every result on average eight and a half times. Right? So, now if you ran this through Excel and you ask it on the chi-square test, is this the uniform distribution? It give, it, okay, this is Microsoft Excel in 2000, all right? Because uh, I, I <laughs> uh, then it said 42% confidence. And if you picked, if you dealt with a pick four lottery, it started in 77, not in 75, so we had less results. Um, and there's 10,000 options. Now, 10,000 is much more than six. 1,500. So you don't get to see even each possible value. And in that case, the chi-squared test on Excel said no confidence at all that this is uniform. Okay, so kind of our standard notion of what's the right thing to test uniformity doesn't seem to work. So here's the problem. Okay, that's one problem, testing uniformity. But here's our problem. You have a huge domain. Okay, it's very big. I'm using big because everyone talks about big data. And this is big data, but it's a, it's a big domain, very big, and you don't have time to see it all. Okay, you want to understand something about your inter distribution. Maybe you want to know, what's the entropy? Maybe you want to know how many distinct elements are in the support of this distribution. Uh, and maybe you want to know something about the shape. Is it uniform? Is it bimodal? Um, is it Zipfian? Is it Gaussian? Uh, maybe you want to know if it's a simple to generate distribution for some notion of simple to generate that I'm not going to define right now. Okay, now in general, I don't want to assume 
that we know anything about the shape of this distribution. For example, I'm not going to assume that this distribution is smooth in any sense. I'm not going to assume that it's some type of Gaussian and I just don't know the parameters. Nothing. We, don't, we know nothing about this distribution. Um, and this kind of problem, you know, this is a problem that is not new. I'm, I'm from the theoretical computer science community. It's not new to us. This kind of problem has been considered in statistics, information theory, machine learning, databases, algorithms, every place. Physics, biology, it's sort of a general type of problem. Um, and so, but I think what's different, what, uh, what has been happening in the last, say, 15, 16 even years, is that there's a focus on the size of the domain. Well, how many samples do you need in terms of the size of the domain? Now, some of you that are used to the statistics literature, it's going to be hard to, to understand my talk. And, I, and uh, so please ask questions, because here's what's different. Um, every time, in, instead of saying, I have a fixed number of samples, what's my error? I'm always going to say, here's the error I want. How many samples do I need? Okay? And this causes tons of confusion. I mean, it's very hard for me to follow a talk from the other people, and I'm sure it's hard for you to follow me. So please just ask, and we'll, we'll work it out together, OK? Uh, so so uh, it's, you know, we have to get across this language barrier. OK, so this is the question for all of these types of problems. How many samples do you need in terms of the domain size? So for most of the talk, I'm going to be talking about sample complexity. I'll mention some computational issues here and there, OK? All right. In particular, what do we care about? We want to know, do you actually have to estimate the probability of each domain item? And then see if this estimate of the distribution, in some sense, you're, do you have to actually learn the distribution? Do you have to learn what's the probability that it assigns to each domain element in order to figure this out? Or can you solve some of these problems with sample complexity that's sublinear in the size of the domain? All right, so that's our big question. And this, of course, would rule out the standard sort of learning-based methods, where you're actually going to learn the probabilities one by one. Now, notice that if you have an assumption, like you assume the distribution is a Gaussian, then you can say, I'm going to just learn a parameter. I don't actually have to learn the probability on each element. But here, we don't have that assumption. Okay? We're not assuming it's a Gaussian. It's some arbitrary distribution. I may be trying to test if it is a Gaussian. <coughs> but but we're trying to understand that without being given any a priori knowledge. OK. So that's the goal, algorithms with sublinear in the sample complexity. I want to say that as opposed to the previous talk here, n is equal to the domain size. And p is usually our distribution. Because this is very different than the last talk. Sometimes we use q also or p prime, but that's the usual. I'm just writing that because uh, it's very different than the last talk. And if you got used to the notation before, it's going to be confusing. OK. So here's some other interest. I'm just going to first start, because this is sort of tutorial-ish tie to talk. I'm going to talk about why you would want to be interested in some of these properties first. And then I'm going to talk about some basic techniques. And, uh, and since I talk fast, it might be all over the place. OK. So here's, and they tried to give me wine at lunch to slow me down. And the, all it managed to do was uh, get me lost on my way over here. <laughs> but I, I, still I find that I'm still talking fast. So I think you're in trouble. OK, slow, you can slow me down if it's too much. <laughs> it's a, OK, so here's another problem. Maybe you have two distributions. Before, we talked about testing whether a distribution is uniform. But maybe you're getting two samples from two different distributions. And you want to know, is this the same distribution, or are they far? You know, maybe it's sales of data, and you want to see between uh, one group of people and another group of people, do they have the same patterns, or are they very different? So a trend change. All right, maybe what you want to do is you're given a joint distribution. You'd like to know, is it independent? OK, how can I tell if it's independent? Uh, maybe I want to know, uh, I mean, so also with diseases, you might similar patterns. Is, are the two distributions the same? Are they correlated with income level, independence? Um, you may want to know something about the shape of the distribution. Is it um, more prevalent near large airports? So is it kind of monotone decreasing with distance from the airport? Uh, in fact, I've seen some data, and I can't find it again. I'm, I've been looking for it. I haven't managed to locate it. Uh, after, the Chernobyl, after the Chernobyl accident, the in, um, cancer incidents, it was monotone decreasing with distance? Well, OK, so you would want it. You would want to ex explain the data of cancer incidents from Chernobyl as monotone decreasing with distance from the um, explosion. 
He wasn't like that because of winds. It was actually a stripe pattern. But the stripes were monotone decreasing. So, you know, but that would be kind of a natural question to ask. Is it monotone decreasing? Answer, no. But, oh, but still an interesting pattern. Okay. Here's another place where you might want to estimate the entropy of a distribution. Um, so these people actually worked on estimating entropy before we did. Um, a, these are physicists that were studying neural signals. And they were trying to see whether a certain neuron was responding to a certain stimuli. Okay, and so they kept um, stimulating the neuron to see, and then they kind of looked at the entropy of the signal of the neuron after they stimulated and used the entropy. Now, the thing is, this has a huge domain size because you have to describe this. Okay, what do you do to describe it? You know, you like break it into little pieces and average. Um, but to, when you discretize this signal, if you don't discretize it enough, then you're not getting a good approximation of this signal. But if you discretize it enough, then you're getting a huge domain size. So how do you estimate the entropy of that in time sublinear? Okay, so uh, this is like, so this was a problem of interest to them. It's also been a problem of interest in many other communities for various reasons I'll mention later. What about just estimating how compressible is your data? Okay, so what do we mean by compressible? Um, so, you know, this kind of problem is used to measure similarities of strings. I think probably more, you, many of you know more, much more than I do about why compressibility is interesting. So I'm not going to say much about it, but, but when we talk about estimating the compressibility, we might be interested in additive estimates. We might be interested in multiplicative estimates. And for example, if you get a really quick estimate of compressibility of kind of two pairs together, that might give you a, a good way of ruling out pairs of strings that are very dissimilar, okay? So I want to say that let's be open-minded about what we mean by approximation here, uh, because some notions of approximation might be the real answer, and some notions of approximation might just give us a good heuristic to get rid of a lot of computation. Um, if we have to do many, many pairs, we can get rid of the really bad ones very quickly, and then go spend our time on the what's left. Okay, so um, why, how we got to it. I mean, how did our community get to this? Actually, a very funny story, but as usual in science, we never get to things kind of on the straight path. Um, actually, we were interested in testing expansion of a graph. We wanted to distinguish graphs that are expanders from graphs that are very far from being expanders. And that turned out to be very s related to these uniformity testing problems. So there was a paper of Goldreich and Ron on, a, on kind of degree, like, uh, degree D expanders, kind of regular graphs, and we know there that if you're in an expander, you should quickly converge to the, station, to the stationary distribution, which is uniform on a deregular graph. Um, and we were looking at what happens on a Markov chain in general that's rapidly mixing, but you don't necessarily know what happens when you're converging to uniform, and that's how we got to these questions, okay? Um, and so there's a lot of uh, work just in that direction. This has been used since then in things such as testing graph isomorphism. I'm not going to go into the exact connection right now, but um, it's sort of that's some of the connections to the theoretical computer science community. Okay, so let's get, that's introduction. Let's get to the model. Okay, the model. You get this black box, it's purple here, but you get to push a button, out comes a sample. That's it. That's the model, okay? Now, this is a distribution over a domain, which for now I'm going to assume is unstructured in um, and I'm just going to give arbitrary labels to the domain elements. I'm going to call them 1 through n, OK? So I'm going to assume the algorithm knows the size of the domain n. And every time I push a button, I'm going to assume we get a sample and it's iid, OK? So no correlations. So this we can assume about the model, OK? Now, there's some underlying probability distribution. We're using p for the distribution. p sub i is going to be the probability that p assound assigns to domain element i, that is not known to us. That is inside the box, but we don't know that, okay? If we knew that, we'd be done. Okay, and we're interested in the sample complexity in terms of n, that's the size of the domain, okay? That's it. Questions on the model? Okay, so let's start with some examples, and, uh, and we'll talk about similarities of distributions. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few kinds of questions here. We want to know if P and Q are close and far. Maybe Q is known to the tester, like maybe Q is the uniform distribution. P is given by samples, OK? Maybe Q is the uniform distribution. Maybe it's some other arbitrary distribution where somebody wrote down for me all the probabilities, Q of element 1, Q of element 2, and so on. But they actually wrote it down for me. So I 
don't have to sample Q. I have it. I know what that distribution is. In fact, I can generate it myself if I want, but um, I don't have to sample it. P, though, I know nothing about. I only get samples. That's one type of question. Q is known. Maybe it's a specific thing, such as uniform. Maybe it's something else. And the other type of question we're going to look at is when Q is also given via samples. So we have two black boxes, one for P, one for Q. Question. No, no, I, want, I don't want to know the distribution. I want to know if the distribution is uniform. But if it's not, I don't need to know the distribution. OK, so if it's like far from uniform, I, I actually don't want to learn it. So this is the question. Basically, it may, may, maybe this is a good question, because maybe this is the distinguishing feature here. Can we do better than learning is really the title of this talk, OK? So, so basically, we're trying to beat the learning balance and see if we can. So this is a weak problem. I'm not trying to say for all, um, I don't want to say how far you are from uniform. I just want to say, yes, if it's uniform, OK, maybe this next slide says, I want to say P is uniform, or I want to say P is far from uniform. Now, if P is, OK, it's called what we might call a gap problem or a promise problem. If P is close to uniform, but not epsilon far in L1 distance, then I can, say, I can say that it's uniform, which is OK, because it's close enough. I can also say it's not uniform, because it's not. So, so kind of I'm saying that in between, either answer is appropriate. Um, and what we're going to see right now is distinguishing whether p is uniform. And p is far in the L1 distance, which I wrote here just to make sure we're all on the same page, is, um, is has sample complexity theta n to the 1 half. Yeah. It's, um, I'm getting to it. OK, I'll just tell you, because you asked. <laughs> that is n over log n due to the valiance. Yeah. So estimating the distance to uniformity is n over log n. But just this simple problem of differentiating uniform from far from uniform, n to the 1 half. OK? You can get this to be a little bit weaker. Like, you can get it to be distinguishing the case where it's epsilon over n to the 1 third from the case where it's epsilon. So we can get like a weak, I call it tolerance. OK, I mean, that's what we call it. The property testing community calls this tolerance, meaning things that don't quite have the property, you still pass them. Um, you can get very weak tolerance, but not, go not good enough. Basically, the valiance, uh, Greg and Paul uh, showed us, I, I have to say, because there are so many valiance now, a, uh, this in particular, this was Greg and Ball show that you cannot uh, you you cannot do this well for the problem of um, for L one. Because it's equivalent to actually estimating part of the Right. So basically, part another kind of theme of this talk is that weak approximations can often be done a lot faster than really good approximations. Okay. So um, I'll get more to it. Um, I do want to say, though, let's start with the L2 norm, because here we're going to see we can get a good approximation, and then we're going to see that uh, not clear that L2 norm makes that much sense, OK? So, but I'm still going to show you. All right, so here's the L2 distance between, um, this is actually the L2 distance squared between P and Q. That's the definition. Uh, and, you know, what Goldrick and Ron said to do, um, they didn't actually study this problem in the, they, they actually studied this exactly for the problem of, uh, of testing expansion, so they didn't actually care about L1 norm, but L1 norm is going to fall directly out of their results. They said, let's study the L2 distance. Now, the L2 distance from P in the uniform distribution, just plugging in that the uniform distribution is 1 over n everywhere, um, is this. And then you, know, you do some simple, this is really simple algebra. Um, I, there's really nothing hidden here, OK? That's just working out the simple algebra. And then you notice, OK, here we're summing all the PIs. And PI is a probability distribution, so that's just one. OK, this, you see it's really simple. And here we're summing 1 over n squared, but we're summing it n times. So that's just what, that's going to be uh, plus 1 over n. So we get, we get this, OK? This is what we get, simple, simple algebra. OK, so we get that the L2 distance from P and U is some PI squared minus 1 over n. OK, good sanity check. If P was the uniform distribution, this would be 0. because, um, And 
that's a good thing. And also, any other option? So uniform distribution minimizes this. That's good, because we're doing L2 distance from uniform distribution. So we're just sanity check. And notice, what is this thing? It's just the collision probability. It's the probability that if I take two samples from P, that I actually get the same domain element. OK, that's all that is. right? So what we're going to do is, since we know 1 over n, we're going to estimate the collision probability of P. And then from that, we're directly going to know what's the L2 distance of P from you. All right, so that's the goal here, OK? And this is what it might look like. And here's the idea of gold and run. We're going to take a sample, let's say a sample of size s, x1 through xs. And now, OK, here's, like kind of, here's the first thing you might think of doing. Let's take pairs, the first two, x1 and x2. Let's see if they collide. And then let's see if x3 and x4 collide. Let's see if x5 and x6 collide. That's great, because it gives me all these indicator variables, and they're all independent, and life is beautiful. But they're saying, OK, no, but if I take x, you know, then from S samples, I get S over 2 samples of the collision probabilities, S over 2 indicators. But they're saying, no, we can look at all pairs. You know, let's define sigma ij to be 1 if xi equals xj, and let's be, let, you know, we had a collision, and 0 otherwise, and we can just sum all these indicator variables divided by the number of pairs. And that's our collision probability. That's a good estimate. <laughs> it's easy to show, I mean, it's kind of completely obvious to show that the expected value of that of A is exactly the collision probability. Now, but the only problem is, how do you talk about the variance because these th indicators are not independent when you do it this way? OK, so they're basically, they're getting, out of S samples, they're getting S squared samples of collision probabilities. So it's obviously not independent because you're using everybody more than once. And so it's not independent. What they showed, you know, they bounded the variance in a very nice way. I'm not going to do it here. <coughs> But they showed that actually there's enough independence in there that the variance is nice. OK? So, um, so that's what they kind of got around. And it turns out um, is that y there is an algorithm. And I'm going to say more. OK, so their initial uh, analysis was not the op is not optimal in terms of epsilon. But it's, um, they got eps 1 over epsilon to the fourth. But later it was improved by others. And it turns out there are, there's not only one algorithm, but several algorithms, which if p is close to u in the uniform distribution, I mean, sorry, in the L2, if the L2 distance between p and the uniform distribution is at most epsilon over 2, then we can pass. And if it's farther than epsilon, then we fail. And we do this, we get the right answer with high probability. Let's say you pick whatever probability you want, beta. I just need to run this thing log 1 over beta times and take the majority answer. So that's not a problem. And overall, like, let's say we just want a constant probability of getting the right answer. Overall, this is going to be our sample in time complexity. So for L2 distance, you can approximate. OK, you can distinguish between epsilon over 2 and epsilon. That, so your answer for L1 distance is not, for L2 distance, you can. For L1, you cannot, OK? OK, so now you say, what's the use of this? You know, here's, maybe, I'll, I mean, first of all, I want you to point it. There was no dependence here on n. We estimated the L2 distance, no dependence on n. In fact, we were a little bit surprised about that. And we were checking for bugs. And then we realized, here's why. OK, the L2 distance is a really weird distance. Um, people like to use it, like in databases, they use it all the time, but it's very strange. So here is an example of why it doesn't always give you what you want. Here's P, uniform on the first half of the domain, and Q, uniform on the second half of the domain. Okay? Their L2, L1 distance is 2, because they share nothing. You know, their support is completely disjoint. So it's as far as possible. But the L2 distance, if you work it out, and I'm not going to do it now, but it's just an easy sum. It's um, one over, it's 2 over square root n. So it's actually quite close in L2 distance. So maybe this is just a nonsensical distance for distributions, and we shouldn't use it at all. On the other hand, we know there's relationships between L2 and L1. So we know that the L2 distance is at most the L1 distance. We know the L1 distance is at most square root n, the L2 distance. So that tells us that if p and q are identical, then both their L2 distance and their L1 distance are 0. But if the L1 distance between p and q are far, then the L2 distance is at least epsilon over square root n. So maybe this is what we should test. No, maybe we should test that the L2 distance 
instead of estimating to whether it's epsilon or two epsilon or epsilon over two, let's test if it's at least epsilon over square root n. Okay, but how many samples do you need to determine this? And that's what we're going to talk about now. Okay, I, and actually, we're not going to talk. I'm just going to say it turns out it's square root n. Okay, so this is, uh, I just want to mention also, there are other ways that have been, I mean, there's been a lot of work on this specific problem over the last 15 years. Paninsky showed that you can actually use a different estimator. It's the number of distinct elements instead of the number of collisions. You know, you take a sample, how many elements appeared exactly once? Okay? So that's another um, estimator you can look at. And that's w the reason I was so specific to say that the chi-squared on Excel only gave us zero confidence or 42% confidence is that actually others, uh, John, Diane, Nicholas, um, Paul, and Greg Valiant, um, and K Diak Nicholas, Kane, Nikishkin, and Valiant and Valiant, all these people have actually looked at what happens with a chi-squared based estimator. Okay, it's not quite chi-squared test, but it's very similar. So I don't want to say chi-squared doesn't work, I just want to say it, um, that it's been kind of similar things have been analyzed and shown to give optimal results. Okay, optimal in terms of epsilon, in terms of uh, everything. Okay, um, I also want to say that uh, Paninsky, okay, oh, this is some history. In the first paper by Goldrick and Run, it was implicit because they didn't talk about L1 distance at all. Um, there's a root n over epsilon to the fourth upper bound for the collision statistics. Um, it's pretty easy to see. Uh, so in this paper, we made it explicit and also sh showed a, very, a fairly easy, straightforward to see um, square root of n lower bound for testing uniformity. Um, so this is all for uniformity testing. Um, Paninsky showed root n over epsilon squared. Um, assuming some, that the epsilon is at least omega n to the minus one fourth, um, and also gave a tight lower bound of root n over epsilon squared. And these guys, this is unpublished, it's very recent, have shown that even when, um, I mean, you don't have to make any assumptions on epsilon, they gave a collision based tester that's optimal for all regimes of epsilon. Okay, so uh, these are, um, okay, so that's some history on that problem. Let me move on. Back to the lottery, there was actually plenty of samples um, in, in that data set that we had. Okay, so that's, okay, let me just mention uh, some other problems. We just talked about whether P is uniform, but actually you can get nearly the same complexity to test whether P is close to any other known distribution. So if you actually write down Q for me, then I can test whether P is, is close to Q in actually I say nearly, it's actually now known to be the same. So scratch that, <laughs> okay? I'm going to show you nearly right now, but I just want to say there is more results that I'm going to mention in a, few, in a few slides that actually it's the same complexity for any known distribution. Okay, so here's one way to do it. It's an easy way to do it, but there are better ways of doing it now. Okay, so let's say Q is some known distribution. I want to test if P is equal to this distribution. Okay, let me... Just, I know the elements, I know Q, I know the names of the elements. Let me, in my mind, resort the labels of Q so that the thing looks monotone, okay? So I'm just gonna write them in order of how big the PIs are. This is in my head, okay? I'm just rechanging the domain names, that's it. All right, okay. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this domain and I'm gonna partition it. Okay, so this was the domain. It looks monotone now. Um, I'm gonna partition it into groups, so that in each group, Q, the, the smallest and the biggest are within a factor of one plus epsilon of each other, okay? So all these guys, they go in the same group, you know, they get put together in the same group, they're a factor of one plus epsilon of each other. I need a little junk group at the bottom that's so small that they don't, it doesn't change anything, okay? Because there I, I can't, you know, like the difference between one over 10,000 million and one over, 20,000 million, I'm not going to worry about that, okay? Because it's so, it's so unlikely in a domain of size a million that, uh, that those things are just going to group together and I'm just going to call that the junk group that gets very little probability. But the rest of these, they're all within one plus epsilon of each other. Um, and what you can show is Q, I mean, when I'm going to do it based on Q, not based on P, because I know Q, I can do that, right? Q is close to uniform on each partition. All right, now, now I'm gonna get samples from P. 
Okay? Now, P, I'm going to relabel the same way I relabeled Q. All right, so P should also, if it's close to Q, it should also look uniform in each of these groups. And it also should give the same weight as Q to those groups. You know, it should, given that I'm in a certain group, I should look uniform. And also, I should, uh, I should pretty much have the same weight that Q assigned to each group. Okay, so that's, I'll do those two tests. You know, I'll get samples from P, I'll bucket them into the different groups, make sure I get pretty much the right number of samples in each bucket, and that each bucket itself looks uniform. Okay, so that's the whole thing. Now this, the way I've described it, gives a logarithmic, this is basically a reduction from testing any distribution to testing uniformity, and it costs you log n overhead. As I said, there are better ways to do it, but even this way has a problem in that the uniformity test has to be a bit tolerant. Notice that even Q isn't exactly uniform here, right? Uh, and so you don't expect P to be uniform. So you want to pass P even if it isn't quite uniform. And what we had before, only guaranteed to pass P if it is uniform, okay? Was not tolerant. And as I said, as we talked about when Guy asked the question, there's a problem. We don't know how to, I mean, we know we can't do this quickly when, when we need to be tolerant. It turns out in this case, you can, okay? Th in this case, it's a special case. You can get around it, okay? That I I'm not going to say how. There is actually multiple ways of getting around it. But, uh, but you can get around it in this case. All right, so about this, um, there have been a lot of results. Again, you know, it started with root n, poly log n, epsilon, one over epsilon to the fourth. And by now, it's um, root n over epsilon squared. And you can use a chi-squared like tester. And you can also use a collision tester. So, um, OK, <coughs> so let's move on. What about closeness of two distributions? Now they're both coming in via samples. OK. So what do you think the sample complexity is here? I mean, everything we've been saying is root n. So how about root n? What do you say? Who votes for root n? That was my vote before. <laughs> that was my vote before we started working on this problem. And we couldn't get it. And I kept thinking there was a bug in our proof. And one day, we, made, we did have a bug. So we did get root n. And then we never could recreate that bug. So we never got it again. And here's the reason. It turns out it's theta n to the 2 thirds. So we found this really surprising. Um, and, uh, and that is the bound on this problem. So why is it, okay, why is it different? It turns out, you know, you can show this is, that all that matters really is collision statistics. You know, how many elements appeared once from P, once from Q? How many elements appeared zero times in P, zero times in Q? How many elements appeared one time in P, two times in Q? You know, those are collision statistics. And if you take all those, you can show that that's all the algorithm needs to look at. It doesn't need to look at the labels of the elements because this is a symmetric property. It doesn't depend on the names of the domain elements. So you can formally show this. Um, but the problem is um, the collision statistics on sort of heavy elements can really hide what's going on in the low level elements. So if you have distributions P and Q that have lots of heavy elements, but they're identical on the heavy elements, and all the difference is happening in the, in the light elements, but you can't tell what's going on because the heavy elements kind of collisions are swamping the collisions of the light elements, then you can construct distributions which kind of fool any, any algorithm that's less than o to the end to order n to the 2 thirds time. Okay? So I don't know if that made any sense, but uh, that's pretty much the whole proof. So, so again, there's a whole history here. Um, it took a while to get the matching lower bound, um, but, there, but it's there. Okay? So, um, OK, as I answered Guy before, if you want to approximate the distance between two distributions, in particular, even if you want to separate whether P and Q are epsilon close from the case that P and Q are 1 minus epsilon far, that seems like that should be trivial, right? It's not. Even that takes n over log n samples. OK, so, so Paul Valiant showed that it takes um, n to the 1 minus O of 1 in 2008, and Greg and Paul showed n over log n in both upper and lower bounds in 2011. Okay, so this is really like an additive estimate of the distance between two distributions. Although I want to say, um, this is actually surprising as an upper bound as well, because it's sublinear in n. It means you don't have to learn the distribution. You know, so it's you know it's I. It's um, really surprising that you really don't have to learn the distribution to estimate their distance or to see if they're close or far, okay? So this is, um, so this is like a sort of a very important thing to know, I think. But this, um, 
Okay. And, the, and I would say sort of the difference here between the previous is sort of like whether you're in a gap problem and you allow or you, you need like <coughs> some sort of tolerance. Okay, it's kind of additive versus, we'll see this theme coming up on other problems later, multiplicative versus additive estimates um, and how much tolerance you allow. So we'll see again some differences in the complexity of problems depending on which regime you're in. Okay. So again, they, what they used to show this was, uh, they used the fact that collisions tell you everything, the collision statistics is all you can look at, um, and they used it both for the lower bounds and for the upper bounds. They, um, what they did is they looked at their collisions and they, um, they wanted to show, for example, so let me, they, their, their algorithm is really interesting. I don't know what Greg is gonna talk about on a Monday, but uh, you should ask him about it, uh, so I'll let him give you the best explanation, but let me just suffice to say that it, they get it to a linear programming <coughs> problem. They get collision statistics, and then they <coughs> ask, is, there, um, is it possible for the distribution to have similar colli collision probabilities? And it, it's a very interesting linear programming problem that they get. It's completely non-trivial, um, and I suggest you ask him since he's in town. Okay, all right, let me move to independence. How much time do I have for this part? Okay, perfect, okay. <laughs> so let me just say something about independence. Um, I'm gonna talk about independence of pairs. So we have pairs of a, you know, we have like two coordinates, A comma B. A is between um, zero and N, and a, okay, so now our domain size is gonna be N times M uh, for the independence problem. Uh, and I think we know what independence means, but let me just say we'll use P1 for the marginal distribution on the first element and P2 for the marginal distribution on the second element, and we're really asking is P equal to P1 cross P2, okay? So that's what we're asking. Um, and we're gonna use this lemma that, um, that if, I mean, one good thing to know is that if P my, is far from independent, um, <coughs> I wanna say something else. If P is far from the product of its marginals, then it's far from any independent distribution. Okay, so, so if it's epsilon far from the product of its marginals, then it's epsilon over three far from any distribution that's independent. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that. We're gonna test if P is far from its marginals and use that to conclude if it's far from its marginals, then it must be far from independent. On the other hand, if it's close to its marginals, then it's close to independent. Okay, so that's how we're, uh, that's how we're gonna test it. And I'm just gonna give you two ideas for how you might test this in the next couple of minutes, okay? So <coughs> one thing you could do is you could just approximate the marginals, okay? You know, let's assume N and M are both big for a second. In fact, let's just for a minute think about N equal to M, all right? I can approximate the marginals in like N or N log N um, for P1, and I can do the same thing for P2. So that's sublinear in N times M, which is N squared right now. Right? So I can just approximate the, this marginal really well and this marginal really well, and then do the identity testing algorithm that we saw before to check that P is close to the product of the marginals. Now these are estimated marginals, so you kind of have to be careful again about this tolerance issue, but again it works, okay? It, you can make it work. When does that approximate your learning? What? When does that approximate with me learning? Yes, yeah, actually, yeah, I actually mean learn it. Okay. Learn it, like learn a really good approximation. And now, but you're not learning P. You're learning the marginals, and you're not learning P. Okay, so, um, so this, so, so yeah. So now we're, we're going to use the identity testing on this, and um, it turns out that this gives you a number of queries. It's kind of O tilde, I'm hiding log factors of N plus M. Okay, and if, it turns out you can get a better, sort of bound than this if, um, I, let me just, let me suffice it to say that you can do a little bit better if the minimum non-zero probability prefix, that means in F1, if things here are either zero or at least B, then you can get a somewhat better um, bound, okay? A, and also if N equals M, this already is a very good idea, okay? This is, why is it good? Because it's like NM to the one half, which, like if n and m are both equal, so this gives you order t O tilde of n samples, but your domain size is n squared, so not bad, right? It's squared with the domain size. 
So, okay, so that, that's great, but what do you do if m is equal to 1? Like, what if m is just a bit? Okay, then what do you do? So that's, um, that's the question. Okay, here's another idea. So that previous thing does not work well when m is equal to 1, because if m is just a bit, then uh, this is giving us some, what is this giving us? It's giving us, this is, wait. Uh, if it's m is just a bit, it's giving us order n, right? And our domain size is 2m if m is just a bit. So it's not so good, right? Okay, so let's try to do better. Okay, now here's another idea. We have the distribution p. We can also create p1 cross p2, the product of the marginals. Why? I can take a sample from p and ignore the second element. So that gives me a random sample of p1. And then I can take another sample from p. Okay, that's iid from the first sample. And ignore the first element. That gives me a sample of p2. Now I put them together, but because they came from two different samples, they're independent of each other. Okay, so that gives me a random sample from p1 cross p2. So kind of two samples from p gives me a, a, a random sample from p1 cross p2. Then we can just use the closeness algorithm we had before. And that is, remember, that was something like n to the two-thirds. So we'll do that. And then we get nm to the two-thirds. Okay, so that's another idea. You can do better if the max probability element is bounded from above. Okay, so it turns out one, one works when the max probability, when the, when the lowest, when all elements are either zero or at least b. He, this works really well when no element is bigger than b. Okay, so it turns out you can put these two together. Okay, that was, that's one way of doing this. There are other ways of doing it. I just wanted to say somehow, let me skip this because I don't want to get into it too much, but you can kind of get the boast, bo best of both worlds by partitioning the domain into parts where one algorithm works better and parts where the other algorithm works better, and then you just have to show that you can paste everything together, which requires another test, a set of tests, but you can do this, okay? So in the end, um, and there are, um, in the end, you know, basically this is n to the two-thirds, m to the one-third. Okay, where I'm assuming without loss of generality that n is bigger than m. Okay, so that's a, that's where we are on independence testing. Do I have a couple of minutes or should I stop? A, okay, I'll take, I'll just take a little because, oh, it's, I think this is further than I expected to get to, but that's okay. <coughs> a, why don't I give you a break? Yeah, you're supposed to have a break now anyway, right? Yeah, everybody can resume in 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>